Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another season of A View from Earth. This is our fourth season. We have been doing this for almost an entire year now, and we are so happy that you are back with us. Hopefully, you've been with us for this whole year, and that'd be awesome. But uh, we are the official podcast of Fisk Planetarium here at the University of Colorado in Boulder. And as always, my name is Tara. I'm a planetary scientist and a CU alum. I'm also the outreach coordinator for FISC and a presenter and all sorts of other cool things. And back with me again is my co-host, Colin. Hi, Colin. Hi, Tara, wearer of all hats. Uh, hi, <laughs> yeah, uh, as always, I'm Colin Sinclair. I'm an undergrad at CU. I study astrophysics and computer science. Uh, I work at FISC as a presenter, um, as a co-host of this podcast. Um, and, uh, you know, that's what I do. I'm also, uh, an LA at the learning assistant program is another thing that I do at CU. So that's fun. Um, yeah. Colin also wears many hats and not with us this week is our producer, John tears. This is where we insert like a Tori Amos song or something. Uh, you, John. John, of course we can't be Fiskers forever. And some of us have to go on and move on to bigger and better things. So we had to say goodbye to our dear John, but we have our brand new producer, Jeremy. Hi, Jeremy. Hello. I'm yeah, I'm super excited to be here. Uh, I know I have big shoes to fill coming uh, from John. He did an excellent job on this podcast. And a little bit about me, I kind of have a similar background as Tara and John, and probably will soon to be Colin. Uh, I've, you know, graduated from CU Boulder in 2018 uh, from the Astrophysical Planetary Sciences Department. Since then, I mean, well, since before then, I've been working at FISC for almost five years now. And in that time, I've done just about everything that FISC has to offer and coming up with new things, uh, working mainly as an education education assistant, uh, developing new programs and learning how we can, you know, implement our programs in a virtual setting, especially in this last year. And uh, now kind of tack on a pod podcast producing to my uh, resume. So I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to this season very much. Yeah, we're going to have fun. So if any of you have been watching the Fisk YouTube channel, you've probably seen Jeremy all over that too. We did the Dome to Home stuff and several other things. So we're happy to have him on the podcast team now. Yay. Hey, and that's a good reminder to any audio only listeners to go check out our YouTube channel. If you're curious about other stuff, you can find the video versions of these podcasts there and just a whole bunch of other cool content that uh, comes from Fisk. And that's how you'll know it's a new season of View from Earth because my hair is a totally different color. <laughs> yeah, right. I wonder, there's got to have been like in between there during a season that your hair also changes color. We should we should do a a, a study, see how many colors yes. has Tara's hair been during the podcast. <laughs> hmm. Let's see if we get it funded for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, right. Let's get a funded <laughs> study going. Yeah, uh, I'm sure. I'm sure that uh, that would be a hot topic in in science world right now. Right, for sure. Speaking of funded studies, today we are talking about the wave center, which deals with gravity waves. This is, sounds very complicated, but our guests today are Dr. Cora Randall and Dr. Lynn Harvey, who work on the wave center project, I guess. It's kind of a confusing setup, the way that this, this whole thing comes together, because they work on a team that well, Colin, you were really good at describing this. How do how did we break down the structure of this drive initiative and the wave center and all of that? Yeah, so I think let's if we start from the top and then like work our way down. So at the very top, of course, um, there is the Earth. The Earth is split into countries. No, I'm just kidding. So so we NASA funds a sponsors a uh, a project called the Drive. Uh, is it the Drive Initiative or I don't, I don't know what to call it? But Drive is this this overarching idea that no one team or group, um, you know, there are, there are questions so big that no one team or group can, can answer that question fully by itself. So the, the, I'll call it an initiative that might be incorrect, but this drive initiative that NASA is kind of, you know, uh, spearheading 
basically asks groups from you know different institutions around the U.S. and I, it could be global. I'm not sure uh, to to focus on questions together and answer smaller pieces of these bigger questions. So at the top, you have the drive initiative. That's kind of this whole thing. And then there's different drive centers. And each drive center, if I understand correctly, studies one big picture item, right? And so, um, you know, in this case, uh, well, actually, WAVE is, is not a drive center. It's the next level down. So each drive center has its constituent, you know, groups or, or uh, uh, contributors. And WAVE is one of those contributors to a drive center, it sounds like, um, or is that incorrect? Is that so it's, drive is the big one, and then right underneath that is the wave center. Oh, so so the wave center is one of the drive centers, right? It's Got it. Of, there was nine altogether, and wave is right. one of them, right? And then wave the wave center has contributors from different institutions. Got yes. it. So so right. you have drive, then the drive centers. What wave is one of those? And then, you know, different contributors contribute to WAVE. I'm thinking of like a binary tree. Like that's kind of what it looks like to me in my head. Yeah, exactly. So. I see the word <clears throat> chart in my brain. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. And so then there, but those each individual centers like WAVE have contributors from not just like CU Boulder, but from all over the place. Right. So it's a very, and like she was saying, they, they go into this kind of towards the end of the interview. We talk about these drive centers and what WAVE is in particular. Um, but they have people not just studying that one thing, but it's very like interdisciplinary and mm -hmm. they're bringing in, you know, atmospheric scientists and physicists and chemists and right. everybody kind of coming together to work on this problem. Well, and it, it, it sounds like it really is emphasizing that, you know, that diversity and teamwork is the key to, you know, moving science along and understanding things. Uh, more quickly because you know one person cannot <laughs> unlock the mysteries of an entire field um, right yeah even a small portion of the field that's something that you know i think is very very relevant in science because especially when you're talking about something like the atmosphere of a planet like the earth i mean what goes into controlling our atmosphere everything all of it <laughs> <laughs> it's you know input from the sun and radiation from the ground and what are people doing and hey there's a plane and you know like she, she kind of mentioned the butterfly effect yeah. there's so many things that happen that influence everything around you because it's all connected man mm. you know it's it's a big problem so you can't just have like one atmospheric scientist that's going to figure all this out that's not yeah. how it works right right so i guess to, to kind of introduce wave it stands for wave induced that's hyphenated so that's only the w wave induced atmospheric variability enterprise so because it has to be an acronym it has to <laughs> otherwise it has an and it has to be the acronym that like <laughs> describes the thing itself you know it's very <laughs> I love nasa acronyms wave induced atmospheric variability enterprise that's what wave is it's an enterprise it is. It's a huge deal. Uh, and so, yeah, and I guess really quick, you know, just to, I, because, you know, Jeremy mentioned that we didn't really describe what this center is. So um, I'll just read their, their, you know, little two sentence blurb uh, on the front of their webpage, which we'll link. It says wave induced spatial and temporal variability of the atmosphere of the mesosphere, thermosphere and ionosphere or MTI for short can dramatically affect the world's communication, navigation and surveillance systems. Yet MTI variability is poorly represented in current space weather and climate models. Wave is developing powerful new paradigms for modeling how waves from below impact the MTI. Wave innovations will usher in the next generation of MTI weather and climate prediction capabilities. So that's what the Wave Center is doing. That's a nice, their, their little uh, self bio thing is, that's very well-rounded. But I like that they put it in terms of here's how this actually affects you. This is actually dealing with weather and space weather, mm -hmm. which we've talked about here on the podcast before. Sure have. Well, it's kind of cool. It's the, the blend between the two. Then they talked about that, you know, how does mm -hmm. you have to take input from both sides and also a million other things and uh, figure it out. You know, shoot, one thing I wanted to ask that I forgot to was uh, how, how long we've known about gravity waves, right? When was, when did that become a, a part of the uh, vernacular? And I <laughs> totally forgot. So you should go onto their website <gasps> and ask that question. You're absolutely right. And I think I will. 
Perfect. Brilliant thought. Well, shall we get into our interview with Dr. Randall and Dr. Harvey? Yeah, yeah. And just to be clear, this is a double simultaneous interview. Not it's it's unlike most of what we do. So we got two people at once in the same room. And I, I kind of didn't really make that clear when I introduced um, uh, Cora. So <laughs> please forgive me for that. Totes fine. All righty. Hey, let's jump in. All right, and now for our first episode of season four, we are talking to Dr. Lynn Harvey, who is the project manager for WAVE. She is a research scientist at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado Boulder. Her primary research interest is understanding how the wintertime polar vortex is coupled to remote regions of the atmosphere ionosphere system. In particular, she is a world leader in the identification of Arctic and Antarctic polar vortices in the stratosphere and mesosphere. Her research is conducted using observations and numerical model simulations synergistically. And we also have Dr. Coral Ra Cora Randall, who is the WAVE principal investigator. She's a distinguished professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences and is part of the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics, or LASP. Her main area of expertise is remote sensing of the Earth's middle atmosphere with particular emphasis on the polar regions. Professor Randall is a current or prior member of numerous international satellite science teams, has won a number of awards and recognition for her scientific contributions, and is an elected fellow of the American Geophysical Union and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So Dr. Randall, Dr. Harvey, thank you so much for joining us today. Happy to be here. Hey. Hello. So we'll start off kind of with a pretty broad overarching question, but we want to talk about wave. What is wave? Wave is, an, is investigating gravity waves, which are different from gravitational waves, which we normally think of with things like, you know, black holes and big astrophysical objects. So what exactly are gravity waves and how do they differ from these gravitational waves or how do these gravity waves work? So, so gravity waves, as we are investigating them, they are um, formed in the Earth's atmosphere. So whereas the gravitational waves you're talking about are um, extraterrestrial, um, the, the gravity waves that we're talking about are actually generated in the Earth's atmosphere. A lot of them are generated um, near the surface um, by weather phenomena. For instance, a thunderstorm might generate uh, gravity waves or a hurricane might generate gravity waves or just very fast winds that come over the mountains might uh, generate gravity waves. And then though they're called gravity waves because the air maybe is you know, uplifted and then pulled back down by gravity, but it's pulled a little too far. So then it goes back up again to compensate. And then it goes back down again because of gravity. And so it forms this wave-like structure in the atmosphere. Um, and those waves, um, even if they're generated way down low near the surface, they can actually then travel up through the atmosphere. And because it's a wave, it will cause variations in the atmosphere itself. It'll say the density of the atmosphere will then take on this wave-like characteristic or anything in the atmosphere. The temperature will take on a wave-like characteristic or say ozone in the stratosphere will take on a wave-like characteristic. And these can propagate all the way up through the upper atmosphere into the ionosphere. Um, and because they cause variations and we need the ionosphere to help with communication, say with satellites, GPS communication, they can actually then affect those communications. So that's kind of it in a nutshell, I would say. Okay, really quick in this, I, this might not be a really quick question, but we're talking to two atmosphere experts. So let's hope. Uh, can we talk about the, the layers of the atmosphere that you were just describing, just for anyone listening that isn't an atmospheric scientist, so that we're all on the same page going into this conversation? Sure. Lynn, do you want to jump in? Sure. I think <clears throat> I think I could handle that one. So we, there are four main layers of the atmosphere, and it's dictated based on the vertical profile of temperature. Uh, lowest down is the troposphere where things are, are the warmest. And as you increase in altitude, the temperature decreases. And 
you get to a certain altitude, the top of the troposphere called the tropopause, where you've got really cold temperatures. But at some point, the temperatures start to increase with height. And I love to ask people, why is this? Why so far away from the Earth's surface would the temperatures start to get warmer? And it's all because of ozone that creates the stratosphere. Uh, ozone absorbs UV radiation and creates a kind of warmer layer on top of this cold area. And then uh, once you get away from the ozone, the uh, temperature starts to decrease again and you get the mesosphere. And that's a, a well-mixed layer. You've got cold above warm and that, that's not happy. So it wants to mix. Um, and then you get even higher and the temperature starts to increase again because well, temperature doesn't really make any sense. The molecules are so far apart and they're moving so fast that the temperature is, is really warm, but um, we call that the thermosphere. So we've got troposphere, stratosphere, mesosphere, thermosphere, and the ionosphere is embedded within the thermosphere. That's a region of the atmosphere where you have charged particles and things don't move around based on high and low pressure anymore. It's really a all magnetic field and uh, electric field kind of stuff, but you're pretty much in outer space. Awesome, perfect. Thanks, Lynn. That make, that was a great explanation. I understand personally atmosphere, the layers of the atmosphere better now than I did before. So, okay, going back, uh, Cora, you were saying that, you know, the gravity, they're called gravity waves because gravity is responsible for pulling that gas down in the atmosphere. And then it, you know, it reacts and then we have waves. Uh, I've you know, always been under the impression that the gas particles that are in the atmosphere around us are you know, so um, not massive that you know, they can kind of float around freely, almost you know, unaffected by gravity, other than the sense that you know, there's air pressure because of the atmosphere's weight on top of it. So how does gravity you know, select, so to speak, parts of this gas to pull down and not others in such that it would create this, this moving thing. So, so gravity, of course, is, is always working on the entire atmosphere. That's, that's why we have an atmosphere, otherwise everything would have escaped. Um, but, but it's a great question to say, well, why, why specifically would you get this, this wave-like structure? You always have to have an impetus for it. So what happens is you have to have some sort of force that actually forces some air starting upwards. And that's then the air that would uh, be worked on by the gravity. So, so as I was saying, like, like a thunderstorm or something, or actually maybe an easier one is um, the wind over a mountain. So you have a big mountain here, okay? Wind is coming along, it gets blocked, right? Well, that wind has to go somewhere. So it'll come up along the mountain. And then when it gets to the top, the gravity will pull it back down. And, and that's then when you start that, that wave-like activity. So to maybe put it in a physicist's vocabulary, it is about the acceleration of that gas that, you know, that up then down that is creating this, this wave-like structure that we see. Exactly. That force that forces it up, right? That's an acceleration by definition. So exactly. Awesome. So now that we know kind of what gravity waves are, maybe I'll turn it back to Lynn and ask, how do we observe such waves? Because I've been in the atmosphere for about 21 years now, and I haven't really ever gotten to know any of these gravity waves myself. So how do you as a researcher observe these, these phenomena? You know, I, I come from a weather background and um, what they taught us early on in forecasting was look outside the window. That's the first step. You know, you don't have to look at all these fancy computer models uh, to know that it's raining right now, and that can guide your, your forecast. Uh, so I think you're probably asking, how do we observe them with instrumentation? But you can also see them just with your eye. You can look out the window. And the great thing about gravity waves is that they're visible. That it's science that you can see. It makes it really tractable. You know, you can wrap your mind around it because going back to the layers of the atmosphere and the troposphere, the temperature decreases with height. So when you get that push up, when the air is rising in the ridge part of the wave, it's cooling and it condenses and you can see a cloud form in that part of the wave. And then the air comes back down and it compresses and it heats and the, the vapor uh, evaporates and the cloud goes away. And so you get these ripples 
within the wave ridges where you can see a cloud, no cloud, cloud, no cloud. And I love that about gravity waves. Uh, you, there are other ways in the atmosphere that you can't see and you just have to kind of trust that they're there with you know, our models and, and other data sources. But gravity waves, you can really, you know, anybody can go outside, look up in the sky and if you see streaks of clouds, chances are you've got gravity waves. And then maybe I'll pass it to Cora if we wanted to get a little bit deeper into how do we actually uh, observe them with our instruments. Yeah, because you can, while, you know, what Lynn is talking about is, you know, say clouds in the troposphere, right? So the lowest layer, but when you get above that and even places where, you know, the humidity doesn't work so that you form clouds or something like that, you, you need other kinds of instruments. And um, basically uh, almost all of the instruments that we have, they work by um, sensing electromagnetic radiation. So in the visible part of the spectrum, you know, we would call that light, right? So you, you have to measure light, um, but you also can measure different um, wavelengths that we cannot see um, uh, like in, in the ultraviolet or in the infrared. Um, and so there are actually a number of different say satellite instruments that orbit the earth right now that um, probably the, the ones that are most familiar, they look down on the earth. So you're looking down and you look at radiation that's coming back up to the satellite and you're taking an image of the earth. So you might see um, since the temperature changes in a wave-like pattern with these gravity waves, you might see a place where it's very warm and then right next to it, it's cooler and then it's warmer and then it's cooler. So your image has basically waves in it. So you're, you're measuring a temperature by measuring the radiation that's emitted from a particular region in the atmosphere. And if that temperature field has waves in it, you're actually seeing gravity waves. Um, there are other um, instruments. In fact, the one that, that I am principal investigator of, um, that's it's orbiting the earth and it's looking at ultraviolet radiation that's scattered from the atmosphere. And because the atmosphere in when there's a wave, it has you know high density, low density, high density, low density, you're gonna get differences in the amount of radiation that's scattered. So we can sense that and get pictures of the waves. So these are things in the, you know, it's invisible air, right? Because it's just these molecules, but the but the instruments that are sensing the electromagnetic radiation can actually see those variations. And I'll just plug really quick for any bolder listeners or people that, you know, could come to the planetarium. By the time you hear this, the planetarium will be open again. The building will be open. And something that you can come check out is we have an infrared camera in our lobby that you can come just look at. And it's exactly what Cora is talking about, where it's, it's looking at light in a different part of the spectrum that our eyes don't see. And you can kind of see how it, you know, it's, it's completely different than what you would expect with the colors that we see. Um, and maybe get a feel for what that looks like. I don't know that we'll see any waves though in our lobby that aren't uh, done by you as a person checking out the camera. Probably not. But on a so, windy day, you would see the clouds outside. I mean, we, I don't know if, if you're familiar with lenticular clouds, but when we have like these big Chinook winds and stuff in Boulder, you'll often get these lenticular clouds forming. They, they look like lenses, which is why they're called lenticular clouds. And those are gravity waves. Those are super cool. I love seeing those. So another question that we had is, you know, these, especially Lynn, you do a lot of this modeling of the atmosphere and both of you are very concerned with the whole atmosphere, uh, which is super complicated. There's a lot going on there. So why is it important that we include these gravity waves in our like general atmospheric models? How do they really affect the whole atmosphere? Why is this important? Yeah, I, I think of this in terms of like the butterfly effect where you have really small perturbations um, that can grow to be large and, and influential. And we really need to strive to include all physics everywhere. Now, it's not possible. You know, you can't uh, include motions into a model that are, you know, centimeters wide. The model grid points themselves are, <clears throat> you know, you may have a grid point in Boulder, you may have another grid point in Denver and everything in between isn't captured. And all of those little motions that are flow around buildings and trees and birds flapping their wings, 
they all matter, but they can't be represented explicitly like in the model. So you have to, but they do impact the, the atmosphere, especially when the waves propagate up like Cora said, and they get larger amplitude because the density is decreasing with height and they'll break and they'll impact the winds way up high. They'll slow the winds down or speed them up. And you have to account for all those little itty bitty waves or else you're just not gonna get your model simulations right. So, you know, we, we fudge, we, you know, use magic, but they're called parameterizations where you, you know, write in an equation to slow the winds down where you think the, the waves are breaking. But, um, you know, it's a challenge. And that's really what the wave project is set to do is to, to represent these waves in a more physical way, but that you can still run the models and not crash it because your grid points are so close together. And, and the simulation will end in your lifetime, right? Uh, where are we in terms of computational power to do that? Um, and where's the trade-off between the models are not good enough versus uh, high, high enough re resolution? And I guess I would add to that also that, um, you know, these waves, they carry momentum and energy with them. And that's why we actually have what, what Lynn refers to as the butterfly effect. I mean, it's a common term, of course, but, um, but that, that when these waves do propagate up, um, they're, they're depositing um, momentum and energy in the atmosphere when they break or dissipate. Um, and so that is going to change the atmosphere wherever they're, they're breaking or dissipating just because of that, that momentum and energy transfer. And as they propagate up, you can also get these effects then going horizontally. And so, um, you know, we, we think that, you know, you can have effects where gravity waves at say the North Polar region are gonna affect things in the South Polar region just because of these interactions that happen along the way. Oh, Lynn, were you going to chime in really quick? Well, just to dovetail on that, you know, the atmosphere is a fluid and it's connected and it, waves can travel from one place to a remote region many, many miles or continents away. And so the entire globe is a closed system and the, and the atmosphere is a fluid. So you get these teleconnections, like Cora was saying, and it's just so interesting to see ripples over here you know, correlated with ripples, you know, way across the ocean. And it's just amazing. You know, in that vein, I remember my freshman year, uh, my roommate told me something that is kind of obvious in hindsight, which is that for any two points on earth that are at, at some temperatures, every single possible temperature exists in between those two points. Cause it has to, because like what you, you know, of what you said that the atmosphere is a closed fluid system. And, you know, I, it took me a while to like figure that out. And I, it kind of blew my mind um, when I, when I got that. Um, so I wanted to ask, you know, we have these, uh, these gravity waves to help inform the, the atmospheric models that the two of you work with, you know, to model the atmosphere. Uh, what sorts of things are you using those models to do? I imagine weather forecasting is probably one of them, um, that if you understand, you know, the motions of the atmosphere, then you can do better forecasting. What other, um, you know, kind of implications do, do these changes to the atmospheric model have um, as far as other applications? Yeah, so, so I would say that, um, you know, one of the big areas that we are interested in is um, space weather forecasting. So, so you're certainly right about weather forecasting, but then there's this whole other area of space weather forecasting um, where we're trying to understand um, how to predict what the atmosphere and ionosphere are doing, you know, up in the upper atmosphere. So where Lynn was talking about the mesosphere, the thermosphere, and then the ionosphere that is kind of embedded in that region. We want to understand how to predict, how to forecast the variability in that region of the atmosphere. And because the waves coming from below are um, affecting the variability in that region, we have to run these models that go all the way from the surface that actually you know, show weather at the surface that might be generating these waves all the way up through the mesosphere, thermosphere, and ionosphere. Um, and that not only um, show how the waves are affecting the variability in the upper atmosphere, but then also take the input from above, say, say um, electrons and protons that are precipitating, meaning you know, falling into the atmosphere from the magnetosphere, 
or protons coming from the sun, these you know, big when you have a coronal mass ejection and then you have a solar proton event where energetic particles come into the atmosphere, we want to know how does the atmosphere and ionosphere respond to these you know, solar and magnetospheric forcings. And you can only um, say well how it's going to respond if you understand how the upper atmosphere and ionosphere are varying in the first place. And you can only understand how they're varying if you know what's going on with the waves and how the waves are really forcing changes in that region of the atmosphere and ionosphere. So I have to ask, how close are we, right? Because, you know, that's kind of the whole catch with making these predictions is then you test them and say, well, was it right? And I am curious, you know, kind of where we're at as, as science and as a whole. Far. But that's what the drive center is all about. <laughs> right? That's what the drive center is all about. The drive center, you know, science kind of inches along, you know, steps along year by year, decade by decade. And the drive center is meant to kind of put down a highway where you zip and make a lot of progress in a short amount of time by bringing together a group of people who have expertise in all kinds of different areas. And we can really tackle this, this big problem that's just a, too big for any one person or, or a couple different separate groups to tackle. And so, you know, it's our hope that even though we are far, Right now, we can outline some science and, and methods to solve some of these issues and make some massive progress in the next five years. I have to ask, the project is called Drive and you compared it to a highway. Is that like just part of the encapsulation of the project or was that a complete coincidence? That was a total accident. <laughs> nice, nice, way to go. Yeah, it's, it's all coming together. Right? So we mentioned earlier, you know, there's always this confusion between gravity waves and gravitational waves, and these are pretty much completely different things. Um, and just sort of a fun question for either of you or both of you, if you could maybe rename one of these to make it more distinct, what would you, what would you call it? Would you stick with gravity waves or should we call gravitational something else? I think that we should be able to retain the name gravity waves. <clears throat> I mean, gravity is our restoring force, right? I'm just joking. Um, you know, but in that, in that spirit, maybe the gravitational waves could, could have a name that, that lets people know that we're talking about something that's the size of the universe. You know, something that's super, super large scale, universal waves or something. Cora, what do you think? Um, I, I, I like your idea. I, I don't know enough about gravitational waves to be able to think of a different name for them. And gravity waves is so perfect for the atmospheric gravity waves. There, there are, you know, some people in their papers do specifically, you know, they use the acronym AGWs, atmospheric gravity waves. I probably, I'm not sure, but probably to at least in part distinguish them from gravitational waves. But um, saying atmospheric gravity waves, you know, that's a mouthful. It's <laughs> gravity waves is easier. Aren't they sometimes called buoyancy waves? <clears throat> yeah. And you know, that, that actually would be okay too. Um, people understand buoyancy, um, you know, it's, and that's truly what we're, what the gravity is counteracting. So. Because that's the upward, right? The not with the forced mountain case, but with the thunderstorm and the, the hurricane and all that usually have the air moving upward because it's buoyant. But uh, yeah, I'm going to really be a, an advocate for us keeping the name gravity wave. You know, we'll have something to find I, some black hole people and see what they have to say. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. I wonder how they would feel about like space time waves, you know, because then it gets really like cosmic, like you can really tell like, okay, we're dealing like you said, Lynn, with something on a very like astrophysical scale, you know, and that sounds super cool space time Ooh, waves, space time waves. Yeah. Right? And then I'm sure an astrophysicist would say no, it's gravitational waves, you guys change it. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's curious, because when you said buoyancy waves, you know, that kind of like, <clears throat> Going into this, you know, gravity waves were not intuitive. And the fact that you said, hey, you can look outside and see them, right? If you see these patterns in clouds, that is gravity waves happening in front of you. I would have never guessed that that's like that those two things were connected. 
Um, and that's my own ignorance, of course, but I, it is always interesting to think about, you know, if there's a name for something that can, you know, kind of just be intuitive, like you name it and someone says, yeah, that makes it perfect sense. That's what that is. And, you know, it is what it is, but that's the trouble I think with specific science, then you run out of intuitive names to call everything. So. <laughs> Cora, do you think that he has gravity waves in his background? Are they yeah. over the, the flat irons or are those contrails? Yeah, when we first started talking about this, I was wondering, I know it almost looks like contrails. Now, there, is, there are these striations, you know, maybe maybe those are the, the ridges of, you know, who knows. But <laughs> it, it's, I was going to ask about that. The typical, it's not the typical look, um, you know, I mean, there right, are right. times when it is much more obvious that you have the waves, but. I think a lot of us on the front range are probably used to seeing these gravity waves and not even knowing it. You said like the lenticular clouds. And then also, you know, you definitely get the kind of wavy striated clouds frequently. I didn't know those are gravity waves. I just thought they were super cool. Yeah. You know, there are certain <laughs> places on the globe where people are a little bit more lucky than others and gravity waves are much more prevalent than at other locations. And here in Boulder, Colorado, we are in one of those lucky zones. So here's a question about the, the uh, topology and how that affects it. You know, Boulder is interesting in that it's lots of mountains, lots of mountains, and then like immediately flat in its plains out of like, you know, right at the, at the base of the uh, flat irons. It, does that play a big role? I mean, would you see the same kinds of patterns, you know, say in the middle of, of a mountain range where there's mountains and mountains and mountains and there is still lots of up and down? Or is the fact that Boulder really flattens out right at the base of these foothills next to us, you know, play a big role in the fact that we see so much of the effects of gravity waves here? Yeah, Lynn, you're more the meteorologist here. Certainly, I don't really have a, a strong background in that, but my, my own, um, you know, guess would have been that, first of all, we probably um, have a, a better chance of seeing, say, the lenticular clouds because of if you're in the middle of the mountains, you're going to tend to get more of the um, uplift right above the mountains and you're going to be obscured by more clouds. But I don't know, what do you think? You know, this is a great question. And I think that we should probe it with an expert, e even more expert than us. But I, I know that because we're in Boulder with the you know mountains go flat, uh, that's why we get the Chinook winds. And you can get the winds, you know, <clears throat> being slowed down, and then all of a sudden they're free, and so they they speed up. And my understanding of it may even be like kind of off, but uh, I know that that top topographic detail, that mountainy to nothing, supports the formation of the Chinook winds. Uh, it's kind of my conceptual model that you get gravity waves wherever there are mountains, whether or not you're at a boundary or within embedded within the mountain range or, you know, wherever you are, if you've got, you know, the topography doing this underneath you, you have a, a high chance of the air doing that same motion. So I'd say, no, it doesn't matter that we're on the boundary but it does matter uh, in terms of the winds sometimes. Quickly, what is, I have not heard of this Chinook winds before. Can you explain that? That's where we have these, well, Corey, I'm gonna defer to you after I just give a brief intro because you live right in <laughs> Chinook wind, windland, right on the foothill mountain. But uh, you know, it's these times when you get hundred mile an hour, right? This is like cat, to hurricane force winds um, at certain times, they're just really fast, just you have to tie down your lawn furniture and all this in Boulder, Colorado, even though you, know, you don't have a big hurricane overhead. Yeah, so the wind comes up you know, over the mountain and then it, it comes down and as it's coming down over the mountain, it compresses, so it's warm. So that's why these winds are called Chinook winds. It was a um, Native American, um, a word for, I think it's called snow eater. Um, so because, you know, these tend to happen in, um, you know, January, February or so timeframe, um, the wind comes over, it compresses when, you know, when, when air compresses, it gets warm. Um, and so you might've had a snowstorm or something, but then suddenly the weather, it's actually quite warm. Um, and, you know, maybe in the, the 50s or so in the middle of the winter, right? Even, it can even get in the 60s, right? When we have these winds. So, so it melts the snow. Um, so I think that's how it actually got the name to begin with. 
That is super interesting. I had not ever heard that 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 phenomenon had a name. That's very cool. Okay, so let's uh let's kind of move from a strictly physical scientific part of our conversation to uh we'll start with with Cora. Um let's I want to ask what your involvement in in the wave project is how you became involved with the project and you know more broadly like what the story of your life is that brought you to being involved with wave i know that's a huge question but i'll let you kind of go wherever you want with that and we'll see what happens okay yeah that's, that's a pretty big question <laughs> I, i'm pretty old <laughs> lots of years before this um, um so um yeah, so I'm the principal investigator of WAVE. So, so I came up with the idea of actually proposing to NASA for this. And really what happened was um, I went, I, I uh, was planning my, one of my sabbaticals. And, um, and I, I am the principal investigator on an instrument called the Cloud Imaging and Particle Size Instrument, or SIPS, on a NASA mission. It's, it's orbiting around the Earth um, called AIM, the Aronomy of Ice in the Mesosphere. Um, this instrument was, was designed to um, look at clouds in the mesosphere, so clouds 50 miles above the Earth. But it turns out that we can actually see gravity waves with our measurements. They're gravity waves at the stratopause, so around the top of the stratosphere or very lower uh, mesosphere. Um, but we had just started producing um, data sets that actually showed these gravity waves, and I wanted to learn more about it. Um, so I decided to go on sabbatical to work with Joan Alexander, who is a world's expert on gravity wave measurements um, at Northwest Research Associates here in Boulder. Um, and it just so happened that NASA at the same time came out with this announcement. They were soliciting proposals for these drive centers. And I thought, wow, one of the, you know, one uh, thing that I could try to accomplish during my sabbatical is writing a proposal to get funding for one of these drive centers. So, um, so indeed, you know, we got a whole team of people together and wrote the proposal and were fortunately successful at, uh, you know, getting one of these drive centers. So, so it was really because of, you know, I, you know, lead this instrument where we're making measurements of gravity waves and I wanted to know more about gravity waves because that's definitely not something that, that I was trained in. Um, and uh, you know, decided to to write this proposal. So things really came together in a in a pretty lucky way. Um, but th that's definitely waves are not my area of research. It's <laughs> I I have to think about them because they affect other things that I work on. But um, but I don't have a formal background in them. So then I have to ask, you know, going back a little further, were you always uh, interested in atmospheric? Uh, or, you know, space weather, uh, you know, that area of science? Or, you know, did you, like, did something happen that kind of brought you into the field where, like, what was your kind of, you know, student life yeah. coming into the area? Yeah, it's a, it's a fun question for me. Um, no, I actually was, was not interested in the atmosphere. <laughs> not that I was disinterested in it, but um, uh, when I um, actually went to college, I'll go back that far. Um, I, I didn't know if I wanted to measure, to major in some sort of a science or music. So I was, uh, I had, you know, I played woodwind instruments and well played, I <laughs> haven't had much time recently, but, um, and, and I just, I decided, okay, I need to find a school where I can do both and choose which one I really want to major in. Um, I went to, um, the State University of New York College at Purchase, which is a, a fine arts school, but they also have you know science departments, of course. And the first day there, I was um, meeting with my advisor, who happened to be a chemistry professor. Um, they just assigned them randomly, and I said I wanted to graduate in three years, and could he get me out in three years? And he said, Well, yeah, if you major in chemistry, I can get you out in three years. <laughs> so this was a, you know a financial thing, and. <laughs> So, so I majored in chemistry. Um, as it turned out, um, with that school, um, the fine arts programs, you really had to focus just on the arts. And I really didn't want to just focus on music. I wanted to be able to do more. Um, so it worked out better. And then I you know, joined a concert band in a neighboring school. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so 
um, so I majored in chemistry and then um, as a senior undergraduate, this professor um, who I was supposed to do my um, senior thesis with actually moved to California to Santa Cruz and asked me if I wanted to do my senior thesis in Santa Cruz. So I did. And so I went to Santa Cruz and the group we were in was actually doing biophysics. So we were looking at the spectroscopy of proteins and how what happens when light hits your eye and what happens when blood you know, uh, hooks up with oxygen or, or carbon monoxide or whatever. And so, so I did that as my senior year and my advisor there said, well, you know, if you wanna come to graduate school, we'll allow you both to be a TA and a research associate. <laughs> and I said, and he said, oh, and you don't have to apply. <laughs> you don't have to take the GRE. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay, I'll come to graduate school. I, I hadn't decided to do that or anything. So, so I went to graduate school there. And again, I was doing biophysics. And actually, I then did a postdoc where I was doing molecular orbital calculations. So, you know, theoretical um, physical chemistry. And, uh, and then I actually came back to Santa Cruz after my postdoc, which was at Carnegie Mellon. And um, I, I'm a runner. I was running the Beta Breakers race in San Francisco, and I met my future husband. And he was living in Colorado. And when we decided to get married, I said, I would like to live in Colorado. So I just looked for a job in Colorado. And there happened to be an opening at LASP um, for somebody to work on the Hubble Space Telescope. So I said, oh, well, I'll apply. <laughs> I, it was to work on the telescope and to do work with comets. I didn't know the first thing about comets or telescopes, <laughs> but I knew something about spectroscopy. And, and so I applied and I got the job. So I started working on the space telescope. And about four years after I came to LASP, they, the instrument that I was working on was taken out of the telescope. And it just happened to be that a team at LASP working with people at the Naval Research Lab needed somebody with some of my expertise to look at observations from an Earth orbiting satellite that was looking at the Earth. And they asked me to join and I joined. So I started looking at the atmosphere at that point and have been doing the atmosphere ever since, so. That is one epic story. That's <laughs> awesome. I, it's kind of, a, I mean, it's like a lightning bolt, like how much, you know, your career kind of zigzagged. Music, oh, chemistry, oh, let's do biophysics, and you just gonna keep going. That's right. fantastic. I love it. And Lynn, we'll kind of ask you the same question. What's your involvement in WAVE, and kind of how did you get to this point? Yeah, that's a great question. It's just kind of like mind blowing. Uh, you want to hear my life story. Um, what I was thinking about, Cora, when you were talking is, you know, life isn't always a straight line. And really, I think what's important is when you meet good people, you, you know, I want to keep those people in my life. When I enjoy working with people, when when my environment is conducive to creativity and, and thought provoking, you know, when you feel happy, right? You wanna continue. And Cora, you're just so open to just morph and, and go wherever the wind blows you. Like my, my path has been more of a straight line in science. Now my personal life has taken, you know, twists and turns, but um, I mean, I arrived in college being undecided, but as soon as I took my first meteorology class, I, I knew it, I, it was just like mind blown. And I can pinpoint the exact lecture when the professor introduced the solar system and she drew a little circle for the earth. And she said, if you wanna uh, see things to scale, the sun is like this. And she drew a straight line. And I thought, oh my God, like the earth could just get swallowed into this massive and the chain the difference in the size of the earth which was like a point and the sun which was just a straight line because you couldn't it was so big you couldn't even see the curvature of of the sun i was like <laughs> i've never wavered i've always known that i wanted to go into meteorology and so i got my bachelor's and I didn't really know what I wanted to do with it. I knew I didn't want to forecast because public speaking is really scary, even though I'm doing this. Um, 
I know I didn't want to be like on TV um, with that stress every day. So I, I just continued and went to graduate school and got my master's and my PhD. And my advisor happened to work in the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere and mesosphere. That was his area of expertise. And so that was what my dissertation ended up being in was stratospheric dynamics and how the winds are blowing around up in the up in the stratosphere. And <clears throat> after I, I graduated, I, I worked at NASA Langley and I did projects and worked with other great people out there. But at the time that Cora started working with this instrument that was sampling the Earth's atmosphere and her trajectory took her into the atmosphere, that's when I met her. And I had gone to a meeting in Boulder, uh, a science conference and absolutely fell in love with the mountains. I thought, oh my God, I've got to live there. It's just gorgeous. And I mean, you see the background uh, behind you right now. I was, I stumbled ac across a softball game and I was out in the outfield looking toward the flat irons, trying to field balls going, how can you even focus on the game? This is so magnificent. Anyway, when I met Cora and she lived in Boulder, I was like, ooh, I wanna work with you. Turns out she's the most amazing, fun, brilliant, kind person to work with. So I want to keep her in my life, right? With that philosophy from the beginning, when you meet good people, you, you know, then you, you build this network of, of positivity. And, and I think overall it's, um, you know, that I've always been curious. And so, you know, you ask questions and then the way things always go is that you, you get your question answered sometimes, but you always uh, generate more questions than you ask. And so it's this cycle where if you're asking questions, you're always asking questions. And I love just being curious about everything. And, and the other aspect is perseverance. You know, I think really just about anybody could do just about anything if they just stick with it. And, you know, that's what the whole PhD was. I, you know, wanted to quit every day and it was kind of a drag at times and but you know the there's the science that fires you up and it just keep putting one foot in front of the other and stick with things until you get to the finish line and and then here we kind of are you know things happen and evolve and we're just having fun and we stick with things so now we're doing this amazing drive program and I'm just having a ball and, and I, I should probably add here that, um, yeah, so, so I would never have even considered, um, you know, writing this proposal without Lynn's involvement. And so, you know, I asked her to, to be, you know, the project manager for it. And, you know, so she is really, you know, responsible for keeping us on track and, you know, making sure that we really are hitting all of our milestones and stuff. And I have to say is doing a fantastic job. And I'm very glad that I'm not the one doing that job. <laughs> What a great, oh, sorry, Lynn, go ahead. No, 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 just, you know, the fact that Cora's expertise, well, you know, you, you're broad, so you've got all these different areas, but isn't particularly gravity waves, I think offers this, pro this program a, a unique perspective where, you know, we, we can let other people take the reins on different areas of the science and, and, then she's super smart. So, you know, a, a topic is introduced and you do grasp it, but it's all a process of integrating and in new information and, and gathering great people around us. Our team is absolutely incredible. You know, every single person contributes critical, you know, critically to the team. And I mean, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity for me. Well, it is awesome to hear how excited both of you are to be working on this project and with each other. Um, and it's it's cool. I think, you know, that's kind of the whole reason the show, this this podcast exists is because, you know, the science itself is very interesting. But, if, you know, Tara and I thought, you know, putting this whole thing together that often those stories kind of get lost in people, especially students in, in the sciences. You know, it's easy to just kind of get lost in the books and the information um, in the math, you know, and, and you can kind of lose the humanity of it. And so uh, thank you both very much for sharing uh, that aspect of your lives and your stories 
that led you to uh, this here pod, this interview on our uh, podcast because it's it's great to hear. Um, so let's talk about Drive. Um, Wave is among nine projects launching at institutions nationwide through NASA's Drive Science Center initiative, which and Drive uh, stands for diverse, diversify, realize, integrate, venture, and educate. One of the great NASA acronyms. Um, and so I, I want to ask: Can you tell us a bit more about Drive and why this initiative is so important to uh, the research community? So this was actually something that was recommended by the Solar and Space Physics Decadal Survey. So um, every 10 years, uh, um, there are these decadal surveys that are done um, uh, by the, um, it's basically um, contracted by the National Academy of Sciences. Um, and they try to, they, they get the community together, a uh, very diverse community, and they try to lay out what should be the priorities for the next decade in different areas of science. So this was um, solar and space physics science. The decadal survey came out in 2013 and, um, and largely um, the, the drive centers or the, the drive initiative actually came out as recommendations to NASA and the National Science Foundation for some of their priorities. So the, I, I have to say, I, I always forget what the acronym stands for, which you just said, but um, um, I actually have up in front of me some notes that say exactly what those words really mean. And so, so it's right. It's diversify, realize, integrate, venture, and educate. Um, so, in the decadal survey, they said we really think that um, that you should initiate this this drive program in the next ten years. It's to um, diversify observing platforms with microsatellites and mid-scale ground-based assets. So, part of it is observing. Um, realize scientific potential by sufficiently funding operations and data analysis. Um, integrate observing platforms and strengthen ties between agency disciplines, so very broad there, venture forward with science centers and instrument and technology development. So that's the part that's specifically with these drive centers of which you know, WAVE is one, and then educate, empower, and inspire the next generation of space researchers. So you can see this, this drive initiative is, it's very broad. It has, has these you know, amazing goals um, that they want to achieve. And so the, um, and, and the idea is that, is that they really wanna do breakthrough science with these centers and that in order to do that, you have to break down disciplinary boundaries. So they're really expecting interdisciplinary science to be done. Um, and you know, in solar and space physics, we um, you know we are very interdisciplinary. You know, we go everywhere from the surface, you know, of the Earth out, you know, into the solar system. Um, and so, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and so in order to really make significant progress in this area, to make these big breakthroughs that we're talking about, we have to put together the, the observing, the theory, you know, all the modeling, um, and it has to be in all of these different areas um, of, of research that, you know, in order to put everything together. And um, for these drive science centers, I think the, the thought is that you can't do this just with, as Lynn was saying, just with a single certainly not with a single group at, you know, one institution. Um, and you don't want to have just, you know, individual groups at different institutions, each tackling their own problem. I mean, it's all important, but you have to get these, these groups together. So you have to have these big interdisciplinary teams. You have to learn how to speak each other's language, because as I can tell you from having switched fields, languages are different. You might use the, you know, the same word in different fields, and it means different things. Um, uh, so anyway, so the idea was really to, to form these centers, to bring all of these people together in very interdisciplinary um, ways and be able to tackle big grand challenge problems and, um, you know, really make the next leap forward, um, you know, hopefully, you know, actually establishing new paradigms for how we think about different problems. So is that to say that each of these groups that is, you know, in drive focusing on maybe a smaller part of the bigger puzzle are each of these groups at different institutions or is there any overlap between you know groups at the same institution so um i'm not i'm not sure if you're asking about the different drive centers or 
each drive center, but um, so like our drive center, we have um, we have groups at at several different institutions who are working together, um, and and at at those different institutions, they may have a couple different groups within their institution who are also sure. you know working on it. So it's not like you just have one person at each institution, right? Um, so, so it's both, you know, interdisciplinary within the institution, and then we're bringing these different institutions together. And then you have these nine drive science centers. Each one of them probably has some sort of a structure like that. Got it. Got it. I like that that really sort of breaks down that mental image that people have of, you know, the lone scientist in their little room in front of their computer, just working on their one thing. That's not how it is at all. We're always working together all the time. And I think that's so cool. That's my favorite part of being a scientist is getting to do all of this really cool stuff with cool people from all over. It's great. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. But, you know, scientists tend to be a little bit shy just as a stereotype. And so that person sitting by themselves is probably quite content. And to get people <laughs> into a group and, and talking to each other when their languages are different is kind of scary. And that's why this DRIVE program is perfect. It, it provides a mechanism by which you know, we are encouraged to come together and really push the envelope, you know, go out of our comfort zone try to work together in order to make some radical changes and advances. So I'm curious, how does DRIVE facilitate this conversation between different groups studying different things? Has it been something like, hey, you know, <laughs> meet up digitally, you know, kind of on like some sort of uh, video conferencing service, and that's how you talk? Or is there a lot of travel involved and different groups go to different areas? I know the pandemic probably threw a wrench into that, but I'm curious how the groups, you know, talk to each other and, and decide what to do. So, so the, the drive program was, you know, it started in 2020. And, and so it's only been during the pandemic. So there has been no travel. Um, we actually, though, um, as a part of our program, and I think other teams have done the same thing at, at some level, um, we, uh, we proposed to hold communi a community workshop. And so in fact, just a couple of weeks ago, um, we had a large community workshop. We brought in people from you know, various areas in the, both geographically and um, in terms of the, the, um, their scientific interests. And it was a big Zoom um, workshop. Uh, but it worked really, really well. We had um, breakout groups where you would have maybe, I don't know, 10 people or something in a breakout group. And it was facilitated by a group called the Toolbox Dialogue Initiative, which is a, a team of people at the university or at uh, Michigan State University um, that work on team science. And so there's there's been a big push at NASA um, to get people together and trained to do team science. And so they had you know some workshops um, during the during 2020, where they got all of the drive centers together to talk about how do you do team science and how can you best communicate and things like that. Um, and so, you know, we've had some training among the different centers. Um, and then we've had things like, you know, where we run these workshops to get, you know, not only with the drive, our own drive center, but to get, you know, people in the community involved in this and the idea one of the ideas of the drive centers is to broaden the the work beyond the drive center but also try to integrate the community into this because even though you know these drive centers are you know fairly large um they're nowhere near large enough to really tackle the the problems in the way that we want to so the idea is to try and bring the community into it as well um so i guess that hopefully that kind of gives you a an idea of what how they're working. Totally. Absolutely. Definitely. Well, we're coming to the end of our time here, but we do have one more thing that we want to ask you. We have a segment that we like to do called Capcom Q&A, where we solicit questions from our listeners and pass those on to our experts. So we did have a question come in from Lawrence, who's from Croatia, who wanted to ask, are gravity waves analogous to standing waves in acoustics? Um. I am guessing that, you know, I actually don't, don't know very well, but I'm guessing that standing waves in acoustics are, are um, longitudinal waves, whereas gravity waves are transverse waves. It has to do with where the oscill how the oscillations are going relative to the propagation direction. And so like uh, sound waves, 
um, you know, they're, they're um, oscillating back and forth in the same direction as the waves are propagating, whereas gravity waves are oscillating in the opposite, you know, 90 degrees to the direction of propagation. So I think they're probably fairly different. So to kind of visualize that uh, sound, which is, if I remember correctly, that's a transverse wave. Is that right? It's the same direction? As, oh, longitudinal is the propagation is the same direction as the, and that's like if you had a slinky or maybe an accordion, right? And you're, you know, like it's that kind of movement where the, along the slinky, the coils get close to each other and then spread out. And that's a longitudinal wave. Yeah, like a pressure, a pressure wave, right? That's, that's basically what, what we would be thinking of, I think, for sound waves, right? It's, it's a pressure wave. So. Right, right. And then, but gravity waves are the opposite. They're as if, you know, take like, if you had like a, a tight string and you kind of just shook it up and down and then you see those classic, you know, kind of sine wave shape in the string. Yes, yes. But that would be Got a it. perfect question to post on our wave to a waiver page. And I posted the link to our webpage uh, where a person could go and ask questions just like that. And we can either answer them ourselves or we can go to the team and pose those and get really accurate. Not that your answer wasn't perfect, Cora, but- I don't know, you know it might've been too late. <laughs> <go. laughs> and, and then put the answer on the webpage. And so you can <clears> contribute <throat> to you know, building out these FAQs and that everybody probably wants to know. That's very cool that you have that feature. We'll definitely put that in the episode description so people can go and check that out and submit some questions. That's a little very plug cool. for our webpage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Love that's it. awesome. And it looks like you've already got some questions up there. So are all of those questions below the little submission box questions yeah. that that people have submitted? Yeah, and you know people can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook and mm. Instagram, so they can post questions there too whenever we post pictures or stories. Um, we, we love the interactive nature of the project and we really want to engage with the, with the community. Very cool. Well, listeners, if you are feeling inspired or curious, head over to that website. It'll be in the uh, episode description. That's pretty, that's pretty awesome. All right. Well, uh, I think as Tara said, that's, uh, we're getting close. It's uh, 10 a.m. Uh, Mountain Standard Time. Or actually, it's daylight now. It's the middle of summer. It's not the middle of summer. Summer hasn't even started yet. Uh, <laughs> point being, we've run out our, uh, our time here. But uh, Dr. Randall and Dr. Harvey, thank you so much for taking the time out of your morning to come and chat with Tara and I. This has been an absolute pleasure to learn about Gravity Waves, the Wave Project, and, uh, and your stories uh, coming in. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, my pleasure. And that wraps things up for our first episode of season four of A View from Earth. Um, hey, thanks again to Dr. Lynn Harvey and Cora Randall, uh, Dr. Cora Randall, for uh, you know giving your time to us this morning uh, to talk about gravity waves um, and uh, the waves. <laughs> yeah, if you're audio only, Tara's doing the, the wave with her hands right now. Um, it was a lot of fun to talk to you guys. Hey, stick around next week, uh, which will be June 17th, uh, if our release schedule is as we expect it to be, uh, for a conversation with Paul Taylor about... Uh, the uh, Australia's Aboriginal skies. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, astronomy from another culture, which is going to be really cool. Paul Taylor is a super interesting guy. So stick around for that. Hey, this podcast is available on YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts as always. And uh, if you've only ever watched the video or listened to the audio, check out the other one. See what you think. It might be fun. Uh, our website has a whole bunch of cool stuff for you, colorado.edu forward slash FISC. One of those things is uh, you can ask us questions and we'll pass those questions on to our experts. So if you've ever had a, a space question that you're, you know, just really wanted to know the answer to, but haven't found yet, uh, submit it to us and uh, we'll pass it on. We love uh, those questions for our Capcom segments. Also on our website, you can, drum roll please, da -da -da -da, make a donation to the Fisk Planetarium or specifically to the podcast uh, and help fund the show. If this is important to you, if you like listening, um, it really helps us out and uh, you can know that you're contributing to something that uh, is important to you. So uh, head over to colorado.edu forward slash Fisk, um, F-I-S-K-E as always, uh, and to find all of those fun things. We'll see you next week.